Smashing. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica and I work at Think Positive, which is NUS Scotland's student mental health project funded by the Scottish Government. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you to our discussion this afternoon, Scotland's student mental health in COVID-19. Uh, our original conference, which was crowdsourced with sessions from across Scotland and the wider UK, with an agenda voted on by our student panels, has had to be postponed until October 29th. However, we just thought that today was too good of an opportunity to miss bringing together a representation of the delegates that we were really looking forward to meeting with today. So we're very excited to welcome, based upon our previous delegate ratio, three students, three different student associations, three different institutions, three different mental health organisations, a representative from the Scottish Government, a representative from the Scottish Funding Council, and a representative from NHS Scotland to discuss the way in which their work might have changed or been challenged by COVID-19 and you know what what can we learn how can we share this best practice and our new ways of working across the whole sector. I think it's really important to note this is going to be a discussion this is not intended to be a debate in any way we believe that similarly to a student mental health agreement every one of us has a role to play in designing implementing and supporting student mental health in Scotland. And it's our hope that today's discussion will offer just one example of how that might look. With no further ado, I would like to now introduce our representatives. So I pass you back over uh, to all the lovely people who are joining us today. Sorry, I will, uh, I will start then. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, so my name is Molly Greasley. I'm the Think Positive project manager. Um, and I just want to kind of echo Jess's words and just say a massive thank you and welcome to all the panelists today. Um, I think it's really important that we keep encouraging conversations around student mental health, you know, especially during difficult times. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on on the challenges and potential solutions. Hello, I'm Maura Kerr and I'm from New Batman Abbey College um, just outside Edinburgh. It's a very small college and most of our students are people returning have not had a very good experience of education but are hoping to go on. Um, I'm the support for learning tutor but because we're a small college everybody has more than one job so a part of my job is um, supporting students with mental health and as part of that, I'm on the Equalities, Inclusion and Diversion Committee. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing ideas and sharing practice because it is a very challenging time. And we're quite concerned that some of our students we haven't heard from at all. Others we're keeping good contact with, so it'd be good to hear how other people's experiences are going. Thanks. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Emma Roberts and I'm representing the Scottish Funding Council today um, and I lead on our mental health policy work um, and particularly the implementation of the funding for the additional councillors in the sector. Um, so thank you for Think Positive for inviting me today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Hello, I'm Sandy McLean, um, one of the leads at um, the College Development Network, the support agency for the college sector, and myself and my colleague um, Suzanne Marshall um, facilitate fortnightly network meetings with the um, guidance and student support groups, access and inclusion and safeguarding, all representatives from the college sector. So every fortnight we're meeting with um, our colleagues and really mental health and well-being has been a key area that we've been um, um, addressing during these sessions. Hi everyone, um, I'm Carol Hunter, I'm President of Education and Representation for Fife College Student Association. Um, I'm here with kind of two heads on today because I move into my new role as a guidance advisor at Fife College as well, so keen to see some good ideas and get some shared practice in that with other institutions. So thanks. Good afternoon, um, my name is Christine Muir, I work with the Scottish Recovery Network. 
we work with people, organi organisations and services across Scotland to develop wellbeing and recovery approaches that are relevant to that community of place or community of interest and that are sustainable and led by the views of people with lived experience. Hi, uh, my name is Alexander and uh, I am the Welfare Officer for Aberdeen University Student Association. And I'm also uh, leading the Think Positive project by our university. I'm doing this with a university staff. Thank you. I think I'm next. Hi, I'm Flora Smith. I'm the Director of Wellbeing at the Student Association at the University of St Andrews. Um, so as part of that, I am the lead student representative on wellbeing and mental health. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to see what other institutions are doing to address issues of COVID and mental health and um, see if they're having the same experiences that we are in St Andrews. Duncan, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, hi, I'm Duncan. Um, I'm the Scottish Regional Coordinator for um, Nightline. So Nightline is a student-led listening and information service uh, that runs throughout the night. So students can call about anything that they want to. Um, and we've been working a lot on adapting our processes so that we can continue to support students during uh, COVID-19. So uh, very glad to be part of this discussion and excited to see what we come up with. Hi everyone, um, my name's Al Wilson. I'm the director of the uh, Student Association at Edinburgh College. Um, and uh, I get to work with the full-time officers um, as well as senior management in the college and uh, particularly with our student experience team um, across all the various teams. Hello, uh, my name is Zuzana Nikoska. I'm a um, I'm a senior leader on the senior leadership team uh, for the National Society of Apprentices, and I'm here to give an opinion uh, of life as an apprentice. Hi there, um, my name is Claire O'Donnell. I'm the student wellbeing manager at. Can people hear me? Sorry, um, I'm the student wellbeing manager at the Uni um, University of West of Scotland. And, um, you know, we're really keen that everything we do has students kind of at the heart and that um, our mental health services are co-created with students. So um, thank you, um, NUS Scotland, for inviting me along today. And I'm really um, looking forward to the discussion. Hi, I'm Anna Davidson. I'm the um, Inclusion Manager at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. And I'm responsible for accounts and disability teams. Um, and also for a critical incident team. So I'm really interested in really finding out how we reach the people that we're not reaching that might be in crisis. If any good tips on that, I'd be happy. Hi, I'm just going to jump in and introduce myself because I think I missed my turn. Um, hi, I'm Kat Young. I'm an uh, Assistant Programme Manager 
for mental health and well-being at Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership um, and work for NHS Scotland as part of that. Um, we support kind of the Thrive student population and the Thrive kind of network. Um, so yeah, look forward to discussions and yeah, and thank you very much. Think Positive for some amazing videos this morning. They're really interesting. Hi, I wonder if Stephen's able to go. Yep. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Stephen Paxton. I work for the Scottish Government um, and I work uh, in the area of uh, student mental health and wellbeing uh, gender and gender-based violence. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm looking forward to taking part in and hearing all the discussions that go on this afternoon. Thanks very much to NUS Scotland for organising this event. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks ever so much. Uh, for introducing yourselves. Am I right in thinking, have we all gone? There was 17. There was, I think we were missing somebody. Anne? The, the 18th person might be Rena. Right, okay. So we've 18 people in total now. And that's Rena. Is Rina there? Hello. That was everyone. I think Rena might be our behind the Sorry, scenes. Sorry, hello, I'm here. <laughs> oh, hi, Rena. Sorry, I, I couldn't tell whether you'd said my name because it just said no, and I was like, is that me? <laughs> um, <laughs> but hello, yes, I'm here. Um, I'm kind of a background tech person. I think I've met most of you before, um, but I work on the Think Positive team too um, as a social media person, and I kind of run the comms. Um, and yeah, a bit simple like that. So I'll be around a kind of this looming presence in the background, but I, I am here. <laughs> wow, thanks, Rena. Um, that's that's all brilliant. So um, today we've come together to discuss three different questions, um, and I'm hoping that everyone can see on my mirror board over here um, with lots of different coloured um, mice. Mo uh, pointers moving around, that was the word I was looking for. Uh, so first of all, we would like to begin with what current challenges uh, are there to supporting student mental health during COVID-19? And I'm gonna ask everybody to grab a post-it or two, please, um, and fill them out and then we'll have a discussion on what things you have shared.
Okay, so it looks, we, we look to have a very full board. Um, and I suppose I'd, I'm aware that I'm seeing quite a few themes sort of crop up, which um, I appreciate is what we were expecting. Perhaps uh, something around student engagement, engaging with students, either when they have other priorities or perhaps students that haven't engaged with our services yet before. Um, but also something about digital poverty, job uncertainty that's just cropped up, um, lack of content, contact, but also perhaps the idea that um, video, you know, we can have video call fatigue. Uh, and I'm really quite interested in the, the question around private spaces for students to engage either with each other or, or with services. Uh, so I'd, I'd be really interested to, to hear a little bit more about um, the things that everybody's popped on their, their post-it notes, if anybody's willing to share it. Um, I was just going to comment about, because I had the same comment about Annette, about the lack of um, privacy and um, a lot of students and, and, and our more vulnerable students are living in um, very chaotic contexts and um, there isn't the, safe space or environment to have a confidential conversation. Um, I, I remember listening to students, some of our student carers talking about um, where they could actually access peace and quiet was in their car if they were lucky enough to have one. So, I mean, I think there are real issues just because you have digital and the hardware and devices doesn't mean that access is necessarily gonna be easy for some of our students. And that's really reporting back from what our colleagues are saying at our network meetings. Sorry, this is Sandy from CDN. <laughs> Thank you. So, do you want to go first, Dave? Yeah, um, so I, one of my posts is about the lack of private spaces. Um, and I did that one because I've been having discussions across the sector and it's something that's coming up a lot, um, just to echo what Sandy was saying. Um, also quite a big concern for us at the moment, which intersects quite a lot with mental health is concerns about gender-based violence. Um, and that's um, that's a big concern if people don't have the safety or the private space to have these mental health discussions if they have family relationships or personal relationships that don't allow it. So it's quite a big concern intersecting in both of those areas. Yes, and I think there's also something around physical space in terms of disconnect with um, the usual communication channels. So if you're a student in your second or third year, you may be engaging with clubs, societies, eh, but because you're now removed physically from attending uni, your mindset may be slightly different. Um, I think there's there's um, a lot of work to be done and with digital communication, certainly saying people are still there, because if you're not attending uni and you've moved back to say your hometown, then you're gonna be connecting with a very different set of communication channels, um, or indeed none at all. Yeah, that links quite well into something, one of the poster notes that I put on about the loss of student communities. So like society sports teams who can no longer meet in person. Um, something that we've been trying to think about a lot at St Andrews is um, how we can replace that student experience using um, online resources and it's it's incredibly difficult and I think that nothing's ever going to replace that face-to-face -face interaction but a lot of our student groups have also been very successful at having um, like zoom socials and things like that which which I think they found really beneficial in maintaining that sense of community and friendship which they wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. I can't remember who said it but somebody made a point about it being a um, student and student connections rather than um, the university or the college being the ones that lead on it or the ones that are providing something but actually that there is space for students to come together as peers, as friends um, in the context of just socialising and um, as you were saying Flora that's it's not ideal that it can't be face to face but that's the challenge we're set but perhaps there's something around the setup of the online um, calls and the design of the online calls that could feed into making it um, not the same as face-to-face, -face, but um, a kind of more enjoyable, comfortable experience. I think that's where maybe creativity uh, would come to play. And there's loads of stuff on social media just now of people doing festivals in their back gardens and doing lots of online meetings and stuff and just really kind of trying out new things and not being afraid to try out new things. 
Yeah, I think that's something that we're trying really hard to do with uh, Nightline is creating that environment where students can talk to students because their students are going to be getting lots of information from universities and they might not feel comfortable at talking to a member of staff or especially someone that they don't know. But hopefully having a space where you can talk to someone else who's in the exact same situation where your exams have been disrupted as well. And, you know, everyone's feeling the same frustration. We're trying to like do that. But definitely there's a lot of challenges in doing that online. I think that there's a lot that we could share or learn from other other societies or other groups doing this too. Interesting, maybe got a bit of a, a, a change from the coming through from our counselors that some of the students, particularly the ones that have engaged with them already, um, are feel a bit more comfortable in speaking on telephone than they might do face to face. So there's a contrast to people that aren't happy to use online and others that, that really are. So it's it's been quite interesting to sort of observe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I think it's great to have that, um, the variability, like the, the options there, like the university that I'm at has lots of different platforms for like peer support. So you can either have like Microsoft Teams or kind of Skype calls with people, but then there's also opportunities for like just completely anonymous instant messaging or even emailing, like just having lots of variety. So if you don't, if you have like phone phobia and you hate talking to someone, you can type out your thoughts or you can email it and send it as more of a letter. But I wonder if there's something as well around um, good old fashioned pen pals. <laughs> Safely, Absolutely. if that wouldn't spread stuff. That might know. be a really good idea, especially for like first years coming into the university, especially with all the difficulties that they might experience. It might be good to have like buddy schemes or uh, situations where they can like pair up with someone who's been there a bit longer or maybe even another fresher. I know certainly in St Andrews we run, um, within our academic schools, we run a lot of mentoring programmes for first years where they'll be paired up with an honours student. Um, and I think that things like that are going to become really vital moving into um, September and to ensuring that, you know, students feel that sense of community as well as, you know, the normal practice that we use them for. So like getting them used to how you submit coursework and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Emma, I think it's Emma from Nightline who did the video earlier. Um, she was Emma, yeah. She um, had a really simple way of looking at things, saying acknowledge, ask questions, adapt. And I love I love that. And I love the simplicity of actually acknowledging this is a difficult time and letting people know it's it's okay to to feel the way you're feeling um, and to then ask students um, and the and lecturers and all the stakeholders what it is they, they need at this time and ask again and again. I love that and then um, adapt services and supports to suit that. And I think um, it was really a clear and concise way that I was totally writing it down as she was speaking because I thought that's really great. And I think hope comes into that as well because I know it's very hard for institutions to be um, giving hope because a lot of us don't really know what's happening. Well, we have a limited amount of information about what's happening, but actually just to let people know that, you know, still there, things will be happening, we'll keep you informed, here's resources to support your well-being, and just giving people that little bit of hope that they might have lost, um, understandably, during this time. Oh, I'm, I'm really smiling as, as I'm listening to you guys chat, because um, I think all of this is brilliant, and I suppose I'm also really aware as well that we're as, as we're discussing the challenges, we're also discussing possible solutions. Um, and, and different bits and, and ideas um, that that we can hopefully collate. Um, and I really want to remember all of these so that we can put them on our next board when, when we do our, our, our next question. I wondered if there's something about, so we've, we've obviously chatted about kind of isolation and loneliness and student engagement, but I appreciate there's other things that are going, that are appearing on our board, whether it's unclear messages with guidance or- um, or something around um, kind of online support services. So not necessarily just the, the private spaces, but actually what those services look like and, and how do we deal with them. And I wonder if it's worth trying to put the, I've tried to do this as we were talking, trying to put the board into sort of more themes. And then what I'd really like us to do is look at prioritizing how we might want to respond to those themes in terms of, um, you know, which solutions we might want to offer um, and, and how we might want to, to, to tackle them. Uh, 
I had kind of, when I was thinking about this session, uh, I had already made a few themes um, of things that like I'd gotten back from other volunteers and charity members. Um, and we were looking at like logistical academic issues and that's everything from like not having access to resources at the library or not being able to attend classes because your internet isn't great or you don't have devices or you're now a responsible person. Um, and then everything to like, having, if you have to reset a year because the COVID happened at a time where you haven't quite got the credits to progress and it's, it, you're in like a really difficult situation. Um, being at home and that kind of ties in with like loss of independence because a university is a very important time for developing that and then not being able to do that. But then also like, I think it was mentioned earlier with um, gender-based violence and not, maybe not necessarily that, but just being in a toxic home environment or an environment that you don't feel comfortable in. Um, and also landlord and renting issues, um, institutional issues, um, obviously funding and grants being canceled, um, uncertainty about um, students being able to come to university, people going on years abroad and that being disrupted, especially for like language students, um, and then actual student mental health. So students being at increased risk of kind of everything, bereavement, alcohol and drug misuse, eating or disorder stresses, agoraphobia, like there's a long list of things to look at there. And then my last kind of theme was support for the supporters. So um, students who are supporting other students or staff who are now in a position where they might have to provide even more support than they necessarily were ready for or have been trained for. How do you then support them to do something? Because I imagine many of them didn't sign up for a pandemic. <laughs> But I realize there's probably a lot more themes than that. Those are just some of the ones that I came up with. I think those were really great and things we've um, identified in our street community in St Andrews. I think the last thing which you sort of touched on with renting and things like that is the financial impact it's had on students. Um, we found, especially because of the kind of town that St Andrews is, it's very touristy. Um, oh, the majority of our students who had jobs were employed in um, the what's the word well in like restaurants and in hotels and places like that that are no longer open and they've all lost their jobs um and there's a lot of stress being caused because of the financial instability that they have at the moment um which is then falls back into what Duncan was saying about students being unsure if they can return to the university um because they don't know if they'll be able to afford to keep on living in in the town because it is just ridiculous it's a very mm. expensive place to live yeah, and also um, someone mentioned that some of the only, like people who do need jobs to, in order to afford university, some of the only jobs available now might be key worker roles. But then that also poses difficulty of like, that might be a danger to your health, especially if you have other comorbidities that might have difficulties with your schedule or even just getting jobs nowadays. So there's lots of issues beyond just academics with students, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, that's been highlighted in our um, college network meetings by um, our staff around that whole issue of finance and um, getting all these practical things in place at the moment. Um, and a lot of students on wider access programs are also key workers or carers. So there's a whole lot of new issues arising um, at this time. Susan, just, sorry. Um, just to follow on from that, yes, it's. I've also heard that in some ways students are now focusing more on immediate practical concerns that are much more urgent um, and that's leading them to kind of disengage from, um, yeah. from mental health support. Um, so there's some concerns in the sector that there's, um, I believe the term ticking time bomb was used, that at some point when things go back to some sense of normality, um, there's going to be this big demand for counselling and mental yeah. health services um, because students will have knock-on effects and anxieties from this time um, and they might not have had the time and space to address them right now. Yeah, that's definitely come out through our colleagues. I was also, I was just wondering uh, if Susanna wants to pick up anything about the, the finance and employment side of things, particularly from the perspective of the National Society of Apprentices. Hello everyone. Um, yes, so we have seen two common themes um, occurring, uh, which also relate to the experience of students. Um, that happens to be loneliness. Um, we have received many, many emails to the National Society saying, I'm feeling a bit low, I'm feeling a bit down, I'm a bit lonely. 
don't really know what to do. Um, I guess the the situation of apprenticeships is that quite a lot of the time you would be working away from home, you're living away from home, and you know you'd be estranged from your friends or your um, societies or, or or whatever you would be up to um, doing your apprenticeship course um, when you go home, um, and also poverty and finance. So. Um, mm-hmm. Not sure if you guys are aware, but the apprentice minimum wage is three pounds, uh, four pounds, three pounds eighty, and then four pounds twenty. No, sorry, four pounds twenty-five for the minimum wage, and then when uh, an apprentice is on furlough, um, that goes down to three pounds thirty an hour. So, um, as you can imagine, the upper bound of that is already quite tough to live on. Um, imagine that being reduced to eighty percent of that. Uh, I can, I can only. Um, can only imagine what kind of repercussions that will have on people's health, not only physical but mental. So I think the worry, the worry, and um, about finances is um, quite a key issue. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Thanks, Susanna. Duncan, I think you wanted to say something next. I, I think I did. I, I cannot remember right now. Uh, oh, that was it. Um, yes, um, we were talking about um, one of the things that we've been talking about is like, I can't remember the name of the pyramid, but there's like a pyramid of like human needs. And it's like, you know, to like to survive. And then it comes up. Maslow's like, hierarchy of needs. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Maslow. Everyone <laughs> knows that. Fantastic. Yeah, and uh, I think going on to what you were saying, like I think a lot of people are going, they're not like, it, like things, luxuries and pro- like privileges and things like that aren't exactly priority right now. Like a lot of people are going back down to just like basics, like uh, I just need to work, I need to make money, I need to like just get through this. And that's having an effect on people who are currently doing exams right now or people who are um, like not engaging with university, not because they are choosing not to, but just because they, it's just not a priority. Thanks ever so much, everybody that's that shared thus far. And I, I'm also appreciating the, the folks that have started trying to, sorry, my screen is above me. This is why my hands looks like it's going there. Um, but yeah, trying to, to put all of our post-its into themes. Um, I suppose I'm reading those as being kind of uh, the sort of maybe four key themes that we've put out here is, one, the big digital divide, but also around student poverty um, and be that around lack of uh, private spaces, but also um, digital poverty uh, and worrying about, you know, going back to your basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Looking again somewhere else in terms of unclear messages, guidance, just uncertainty. Um, that sense of loss for many students, you know, if you're not able to have a big graduation this year, um, or, you know, I, I, I was reading a report the other day about from um, high school students not being able to have their last summer before they start university and appreciating that that fits into the people that, you know, are also trying to support when the students are starting, perhaps you know, when they're going to start yet and they're, they're not in the group chat and how do we make sure that we're contacting those. Um, and then that sense of belonging, creating a sense of community uh, on campus, maybe that's through ensuring the students feel they can engage, but bear in mind video call fatigue. Um, and how do we reach students that aren't comfortable with engaging online? Is it that we go back to pen and paper uh, and all those different ideas that we had? Uh, and lastly, that sense of which I appreciate has been put in a, in a different corner, but I think there is still that thing about, you know, how do we, the people that are supporting, how do we support them? So thinking about how isolation, key workers, care responsibilities, homeworking, um, if students have children, but also if staff have, have uh, children. One of the things that came out of our weekly forum last week was about, you know, that feeling that because we're all connected to devices, means that we're instantly available all the time. Um, and how, how do we sort of set those boundaries and, and, and support everybody else to know that it's okay to set those boundaries. Um, so I wonder if there's, there's something in that. 
I'm pretty sure we're going to move on to our next board in about five minutes, which uh, the following question will be, what are our solutions? Um, which I feel quite energised by because we've come up with quite a few. Um, but is there anything else that anybody wants to sort of chuck on this board before we leave it? Um, or uh, any of the themes they think we should be tackling on the next um, question? I think there's something around um, the kind of uh, the particular type of course or study that you're doing as well. Um, there might be um, you you need that kind of structure in your life to be able to engage, and not having that structure can have a massive impact on on how you learn, but also your mental health. Um, so I think that's definitely got a, a a big question mark over those students that really need that okay, well, it's a Tuesday, I, I know that I need to be in college at X time, so therefore I need to do this, that and the other. Um, so that's definitely something which is really difficult for those students who struggle with that self-discipline uh, or, or just don't work in that way. Um, but also, I think further than that, um, students who are studying um, a more hands-on practical based course, which the majority of courses at, at college are, um, is that kind of worry about a not being able to do that thing that you love doing, whether that's hairdressing or automotive engineering or bricklaying or whatever it might be. Um, but B, you know, the kind of fear of um, that, that industry kind of falling apart and you not having um, access to, to uh, support it, you know, just being kind of stuck at home worrying about it. Can I just say, um, I agree with that idea of loss of structure. That's one of the biggest issues coming through for my students, the fact that they miss the classroom contact and miss the structure of lessons. And it doesn't matter how much stuff we put up online and even the Zoom classes. Again, there's the digital poverty. Some can access it, some can. Some, as you say, are working with children. They can't get online at the right times or they are, work, you know, they, they are not savvy enough to work all out. So there's a lot of issues, no matter how much support you put in, this loss of the structure, I think it's the biggest impact of all that we're seeing. Yeah, that was a really good point. And I suppose, sorry, the only other point to make was about the, um, the kind of digital stuff that um, getting that balance between providing uh, as much opportunity for people to engage as possible, but not overwhelming them with things that they're maybe not comfortable with. So not everyone's comfortable with Zoom calls or um, whatever it might be. Um, and if there are five different platforms being used by different lecturers or, or groups, then that, be, that might be quite overwhelming for some people. So it's getting that balance right between you want to give people all the options and whatever works for them, but equally not kind of force it on them. Um, I think some of the ones that we've seen that have worked really well is when students actually kind of decide themselves what format works best for them. Um, and the, you know some of the, the best kind of um, examples are where lectures come together with students and say okay the here are options what do you think would work best for you um so um they've really had an input into that rather than it being forced on them and causing more stress so rather than saying you've got a, a lecture at this time it's um okay what would be best that works for everyone i think that um it's a slightly different perspective on that whole like you know not forcing students to take to like do things at certain times that's something that we've been facing, particularly at St Andrews, is that we have a lot of international students um, and how you do teaching and how you do interactive teaching um, when, you know, you have a, some students will be, it's, when it's the middle of the night for some students and it's the middle of the day for others. Um, I think that that's been a really interesting um, and unique challenge. And then also um, something that's quite specific to our situation but it'll also end up having an impact like it'll likely have, have an impact on things like our student representation um because i know my successor for example is currently eight hours behind the uk and can't join in the meetings that she's supposed to um so we've been thinking really hard about how we can ensure the university continues to engage with the student association um through these times as well i think 
it might also be worthwhile thinking about um, like the staff who provide these lectures or like talks, because a lot of them probably have never used Zoom before or any of the other like online teaching uh, services. And I've heard stories about friends who have been given a, an entire lecture, but the lecture was muted or just didn't know like how to operate it. So it might be really beneficial to like provide them with training or like like skills to deliver online training at uh, teaching as well. And I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I just wanted to flag was, um, I suppose like one of the challenges being about kind of making sure that things are accessible to the whole diversity of the student population and um, you know, be it online teaching or um, support services, making sure that students say with disabilities are being um, you know, given equal access to everything and, and any barriers being removed. Um, that's a good point. That's come up loud and clear in our access and inclusion network around um, accessibility of um, assessment arrangements. And obviously, we all reacted really quickly and it's been fantastic. But maybe moving forward, um, a lot of that needs to be bedded in, I think. Absolutely. And, and uh, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over anybody if I just have I, no, I just to, to flag. Annette uh, has shared in the chat, you know, the, the fact that most of the most learning is or a lot of learning is informal with students helping each other and you know knowing what's on the reading list is really key and talking through what happened in the previous lecture and I suppose I wonder you know if there's something and that in terms of um if anybody's got any ideas on on how we can perhaps start thinking of some possible solutions um for the the themes that we've just brought up I appreciate we're, we're not going to fix it in one conversation and I promise I'm not asking that of anybody. Um, but as we've been talking, we've had some really great ideas of different things that people have tried. Uh, and it, it would be really nice to, to capture all of those as our potential solutions in our next board, if everybody was, was happy to do so. Um, I also just want to flag Stephen has been pointing out things for uh, PGR students as well. And I really wanted to Sort of recognise Claire's point on that diversity of the student population uh, and I appreciate that that's something that will most likely be coming into our solutions but definitely something that we should all be holding um, as, as we think about how we can be of most use.
Well, don't we have a marvellous amount of solutions? These are all looking brilliant. At which point I wondered if um, it would be all right if I could invite you back to, to sort of chat us through some of the different things uh, that you've mentioned. I'm just going to flag some of the things that have come up in the chat. Um, so for instance, Annette's asked us to flag one of the um, services that RGU are running. So for their frontline NHS students, when they come off shift, they're offering an opportunity for them to offload. So it's not a counselling session, um, but it's a, an opportunity for them to share. I'm imagining, Annette, if I'm paraphrasing, please correct me, but an opportunity for them to share how they feel and what's going on and, um, and just off, offload what, what they're thinking about so they're not taking it home with them. Um, and Kat, on behalf of NHS Lothian, has shared you know, that she thinks that most people will feel the benefit of being part of a community of where they live um, and has raised the, the question around, you know, still being able to offer some kind of welcome meet or freshers fair in that broader sense of community. Um, Sandy, I don't want to speak for you. I wonder if you want to share the, your ideas around upskilling. Well, no, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, it's been absolutely phenomenal what um, staff have done in a really short space of time, um, support staff, student associations, lecturers, um, in this emergency situation, it's been fantastic. But there is still the, um, as we've all talked about, I'm one of them, hence my issue with Miro boards and managing to do it all at the same time. It's definitely upskilling of the digital, but also in parallel to that, there's still the fundamental issues around um, digital poverty that can't be fixed overnight. And also the fact that um, a lot of people are, are, are in total crisis at the moment, as we've already talked about. So, you know, the, there's parallel things that need to be addressed. So, um, and, and as I said, there's been a fantastic creative responses already shown right across, um, really holistically across the universities and colleges. It's been amazing. But there's, there's still this other issue and students that I'm concerned around, uh, you know, the estranged students, um, care experienced students in the range of um, really vulnerable students that um, it's really difficult to engage it sometimes at the best of times. Um, and that's just in the, on my mind and, and of our networks. Absolutely. Um, Carol. There's no quick, um, there's no quick solution, but it, it has to be there as we're moving forward if we're looking at, um, you know, accessibility. Carol's just reminded me as well, you know, the, the resources that Fife have shared to upskill their staff and students with exactly what you've just been talking about, uh, Sandy, you know, including how to guides on how to use the Chromebooks that they've provided. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if everybody's aware that they've provided over 500, uh, including hotspots for internet access, uh, which has been fantastic. Yeah. I wonder if there's something as well, just when you're saying, Sandy, around um, the brilliant creativity and that quick call to action of people yeah. um, from the student community and also from communities across Scotland, there has to be something recognised and it's a real chance to highlight, although it was happening already, that um, the third sector and yeah. communities have so much to offer and it's perhaps time at a strategic and funding level that there was a recognition that the treatment route for mental health support shouldn't solely be focused on the NHS route and while many of the NHS initiatives are brilliant and they're needed there it seems to me needs to be a bit of a shift away from giving all the funding to a um, medical model type support mm -hmm. and actually putting a lot more um, or an equal or share of that funding into student initiatives, into community focused um, support and not kind of seeing the, the third sector as something that can kind of be picked up and, and, and kind of dropped off um, in a less sustainable way. And that actually we should be, we should walk alongside the NHS and be equal partners in, in designing and delivering uh, mental health support for people. Yeah, good point. I am happy to come in here. I actually work within NHS Lothian and that's exactly what we're doing in it. It's like we've got a really good partnership with our voluntary sector and across the whole community. 
And that's exactly what we're trying to do, shift that resource away from that acute kind of really reactive model of, you know, and medical model to much more holistic. So if you want to see how like kind of we're progressing within the NHS, like kind of I can share some stuff with you, but our learning and what we're doing within Edinburgh, it's really exciting within the partnership models. I think the old school style was due to things like our procurement and yeah, probably just that whole kind of medical model of mental health, but it's really moving away. And just, just to be clear, the NHS are amazing and their mental health support they provide, it's amazing, but even they would admit themselves that um, it, it's a lot of work and especially what the pandemic's highlighted is that when those NHS Chess staff are needed on the front line for something else, then actually the third sector has really stood up and um, all these amazing creative projects, initiatives that a lot of them have always been there, um, just are often underfunded and under recognised. I'm wondering if I can jump in here, um, because that's exactly where we're, what, um, well, not just Nightline, there's, there's loads of um, third sector charities out there who are providing the support, especially for students. But also students are also very keen to get involved with this stuff. And I think that especially with um, in terms of finances, there's a lot, a lot that can be done with student initiatives um, that are generally quite cheap to run. It just it takes volunteers and maybe like a phone line and some support. Um, and it's a good use of resources and also adds to that sense of community and helping people with purpose and routine. There's there's lots of benefits. And I'd, I'd love to see more um upskilling and training and, and time devoted to these like the third sector and these kind of charities um and i was also wanted to jump on something that was mentioned earlier but um the with staff upskilling with uh, internet skills um also pastoral skills because it's something that's been um talked about a lot where like some staff aren't uh given like the skills to deal with students who are stressed or anxious and it's been flagged up that this might be uh, exacerbated by Corona because students aren't able to deal with it face-to-face um, -face with other members of staff or other students. So staff might find themselves in a situation where they're suddenly giving pastoral support to lots of students and not being given those skills. So it would be great to see some collaborations and maybe even support from the third sector and training staff um, as, a, as a way to like make that financially viable and sustainable and also coordinated. Um, I think Carol, I was wondering if you could jump in here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I think what at Fife we've been trying to do is we did a really quick turnaround. So basically, by the time the, the Easter holidays hit, we had the devices out to the students. We had the user guides up online. We had a new student portal. So everything coronavirus related was all in one place. So students could access it. The Student Association moved everything completely online um, within a few days, to be fair. Um, so we use Microsoft Teams for everything. Um, I do know that other departments within the college use different platforms. It would be great to have a one size consistent approach with everybody, but we get that that sometimes doesn't happen. Um, so we have our SSA digital office. Um, so on that, we have we run our class rep drop-in sessions. They've been taking place since this has happened. Students can come in, they can chat, we upload videos, D just trialing out different things because not everything's going to work the same. Um, our concern is that we have, you know, the usual suspects of who you speak to that take part in the quizzes, the book club, the competitions, everything that happens, it's always the same familiar faces, but it's how do we engage with the students that don't engage with our services how do we know how they're getting on and um, we kind of do a, we just give everybody all the information we possibly can so there was a lot of emphasis on the class reps maybe having to step up a bit more to get that information for students which i didn't agree with because they're like another student dealing with everything else that's going on i know myself i'm working studying and i have three kids at home at the moment so mm -hmm. it should be difficult and um, so what we did is we decided not to put added pressure in so because we had this online and um, digital office it meant that we could share loads of stuff so if it's about funding or if you didn't have a device or if you needed help with mental health and all the helpline numbers. So if all the information was there, the class reps weren't having to ask those sensitive questions to others saying, are you struggling or anything like that? Because it was all in a place that they could find it, they were then just talking about the learning and teaching element. And I think with this, it's very important to highlight that there's not a blanket one size fits all that's gonna sort everything. And it's not always gonna be the same for every institution also. Um, we did a big mental health in the curriculum um, 
one of my pledges was to embed mental health into the curriculum and we did a big research project with students so everything's changing now and um, with the learning and teaching and COVID-19 has kind of helped with that to learn that it should be more fl blended and flexible and things like that to be done in a different way basically make it more inclusive because if you clear it for one you're clearing it for everybody you know the path and um, so it's talking about how we can kind of shape and change that for the better so at the moment we're at a big learning curve but I think there's a lot of positives to come out of it as well as all the negatives and um, we dished out over 500 devices to students including hotspots so they could access the internet now we're looking at when the new students come in how do we find out if they have access to it in an ideal world um, one of my pledges was to reduce the barriers um, to computers on campus, which is then kind of spread like welfare, everything else is going on at the moment. But um, we did look, speak to the funding council about trying to use students using their bursaries to do pay up options for a device. Um, it was kind of shot down, but I think with the current situation, there might be more of, a, of, of an, an agreement on that. Um, I know that we now have the discretionary fund where they can purchase things like that, but we're talking about that every student that needs a device to study should have access to one and how we would do that um, because as we can now see a lot of people say that certain courses don't need devices but we can clearly see that everybody does in some way or another and um, our inclusion are all online now as well and making sure that they're reaching out to students guides are online while their um, phone call appointments and we're also we're really keen just to do video phone calls with people to get that face-to-face -face element with them because that's what they seem to be missing the amount of students that we see now that I just say we just miss popping in and saying hiya so we say we're available on the team's page from whatever time you can pop in and have a conversation about your coursework or you can pop in and have a conversation over a coffee face to face just discussing how your days went really because that's quite quite what's quite important to them we have people that are on their own isolating that are finding it difficult and then you've got people like me that have six people in the house and you're struggling with that so <laughs> there's no it's trying to find that common ground it's trying to we did reaching out to student videos so we got different people from different departments to say hi we're still here everything's still available but it was more like a personal kind of thing so people's dogs were in it my kids were shouting in the background but it was just so people could relate to it and we're now starting to do that with our class reps to say this is how I study I've either got a desk set up or I'm on my bed with like books all over me there's not a normal it's what works for you an important message for students is not to compare themselves to other people because how it works for some people won't always work for others and what of the time you see on social media is not totally true as well so somebody might look like they're really coping but inside they're crying like me um so yeah it's just trying to we're just trying to just show that everybody's human we're all struggling in one way or another um but i think communication is key and having a clear communication to students is what they need it's when you get like these wee, wee bits here and there and they're like what's happening why can't somebody just say right this is what's happening this is what i'm needing from you how can we support you to do that? And I think that's where we're starting to start to get that turnaround now, eh, which is great. But I'll stop talking now. So thanks. Actually, based on that, I have like 10 different things that have popped into my head that I can say. Um, but first, I just wanted to go back to what Duncan was saying about um, volunteering in student groups. And um, at St Andrews, we've been not only um, encouraging students to volunteer if they can in St Andrews, if they're still there, but also um, helping students to find information about how they can help in their local area if they've gone home. Um, and we found that for some students that's really helped with their sense of like empowerment, I guess, because right now it's very easy to feel helpless. Um, another point I was going to make. Oh, yes. Um, actually, Carol, what you were saying about um, student engagement is really interesting and in how typically you do just get the same group of students that are engaging with you all the time. And interestingly, what we found um, at the Student Association St Andrews is that we're getting far more engagement than we used to from students, um, in particular on our online things. So, for example, we are in we're currently in the middle of like our um, awards season, I guess you call it. Um, and so we're putting a lot of things online about society awards and stuff like that. And the engagement we've had in that has been incredible. And I think that's having a knock on effect on, on engagement and things we're having on the engagement we're having in things like um, surveys. Um, so, for example, we had a survey that within about a week managed to get we managed to get feedback from about 10 percent of the student population which is really impressive um, and something that we aren't used to seeing. Um, so I think that there are definitely some positives um, to be taken in, you know, we are using, we're working out how to better engage with students through all of this. Um, so for example, we've been trying to use things like our Facebook page to have slightly more informal communication with students. Um, we've set up a sabbatical, sabbatical office of social distancing diary where there are six of us um, and three times a week one of us will like post our experiences 
Um, and we think that's really helped, firstly, students to relate to us as sabbatical officers and um, make them feel more like, you know, we're students just like them and we're in it with all of them. It also is giving them a better idea of what we do as sabbatical officers, which is a huge issue we've had in the Student Association in recent years. A lot of students just don't know what sabbaticals are doing. Um, but it's also a good way to get some like positive messages out. So, for example, I wrote one a couple of weeks ago about, um, how, you know, um, if you have a chronic illness, which is exacerbated by coronavirus, how you should be kind to yourself because of that and not um, not feel that need to be productive all the time. Um, and we've had really positive feedback on that. And um, I think students have really liked the fact that we're trying to engage in that more sort of informal manner. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to jump in here because um, I've just been having some ideas on, on everything that you both have said. Um, I think that potentially solutions might be smarter publicity, community and coordination. So what I mean by that is um, it's all good putting lots of information up, but there's always going to be people who don't engage or who don't quite like the publicity or quite like the, the look of what resources there are. Um, so for example, um, men are or and boys are often really hard to target with mental health because a lot of the um, publicity or promotional materials doesn't quite appeal to them. Um, but there's been lots of uh, like research already and the Lad Bible is a Facebook group, but they had a massive men's mental health campaign because it's a platform that they find approachable and usable. Um, so that might be something that is worth considering, especially for groups that are harder to reach, like PhD students or students who are a bit more remote or even in different countries now. And that might be a lot of work, that might be a lot of effort, but I'm wondering if there's potential for coordination between the third sector, universities, students, NHS, government. I'm wondering if there's a chance for us to like work on this as a whole, um, rather than each individual institution having to find research on men's mental health and uh, BAME and gender mental health and pro providing these materials. Whereas if we collectively put the work in, then um, we might be able to reach these things quicker and sooner, especially as the new term comes. And I'm really glad that you mentioned St. Andrews because St. Andrews is a university, I am a former alumni there, um, which generally has a really good community. And I, I wonder if that might attribute to the amount of engagement that you've seen with um, like your polls and your surveys because um, the, the community is quite strong. There's lots of traditions, but even just social media uses lots of um, hashtags and, and concepts that bring everyone together. And I'm wondering if that might be uh, an area that we can push for mental health and students next year in that we're gonna, there's lots of challenges. It's very easy to have a community or it's, it's challenging enough to have a community in a university where everyone's at, but having it online is even more difficult. But I'm wondering if the push for community and belonging somewhere, even though it doesn't quite seem natural, it doesn't quite seem like something normal. Um, if you can create a, we're all in this together. Yes, things are hard and yes, we're all going through this um, difficult time, but we're all in it together. Um, and if universities can work on that, as well as like the third sector and kind of everyone come together as part of a, a team, we might reach more people who would otherwise disengage or we might be able to, I don't know, lift people's spirits enough and give them that hope to, to, um, to continue and to, to engage with university. And I, I know that's far easier said than done, but I'm wondering if that's a good place for us to start. Yeah, sorry, just following on from a couple of those points in terms of engagement and building communities and stuff, I think, that, and sorry, um, how some people engage and some people don't engage. I, one of the things that um, I think is really important is that you don't get too bogged down in engagement. I think a lot of the time it's actually information that a lot of people know want um, it, at this kind of stage. So the yeah. one of the things I was saying earlier on is that there's a huge difference between reacting to a crisis and and um kind of managing that process from everyone on campus to suddenly everyone online and then the kind of longer term impacts um and i think that a lot of institutions have done a lot of very good stuff in a very short period of time um uh, and and it's been really impressive however that is very much focused on the kind of month to two months of the end of term um, and actually, if we're starting to talk about what are the impacts on students going forward for the next 12, 18, 24 months, that's a very different conversation. 
Um, so at the minute, I think I'm not that, um, I'm not too concerned about the same people turning up to the same virtual events and all the rest of it, because it's actually, if I know people are reading that stuff or um, class reps are sharing it with their class or um, lectures are sharing it with their classes or whatever it might be, then that's a good thing. Um, and, you know, you can't get disheartened whenever you've put the same post um, on 20 different groups and then someone says, oh, I've never heard of that before. Um, <laughs> that's just the world we live in, um, unfortunately. Um, so I think giving the information as much as possible, as clearly as possible and keeping it simple is important. Um, I think probably the longer term issue is we already have a group. We already have a community that exists. It's next academic year, whenever you're building a community from scratch. And if that is part on campus, part off campus or entirely off campus or whatever it might be, then that's going to be very different to anything any of us have ever experienced before. Um, and I know from a student association point of view, um, even though we work across multiple campuses and we're used to online technology to engage with people, the initial engagement and building a, 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 a relationship with uh, groups of students is that face-to-face -face contact. You're the person that they see when they walk through the door on the first day and don't know what they're doing. Um, that's that's going to be a big challenge, I think, going forward. But we're working on solutions at this <laughs> stage. Um, so I just think that the, maybe one of the positive things to come out of this is that we will all know what um, digital software works um, for our groups of students. We'll all be better at using it, hopefully. And hopefully a lot of students will be better at using it as well. So I think there are some positives in that sense to come out of it. I'll shut up now. <laughs> No, thanks, Al. That's that's brilliant. Point, yeah. Um, I, I'm aware that we're at half three, and I did promise you guys a, a ten minute break. Um, but before we, we go into that, I just I suppose I wanted to kind of reflect on the bits that we have discussed because I appreciate it's a very big board that we've we've all just looked at, um, and we've brought up a lot about upskilling and um, how we can build communities online and. And whether is it, you know, the way that we talk to people, so is it the different platforms that we're using and whistling people up in, or is it actually the, the specific communication, to, you know, blurb bits that we're using? I think that's what I'm going to go with. Um, and I also wanted to kind of highlight um, some of Susanna's points in this, and I don't know, Susanna, if you're happy to kind of expand a little bit more, but also thinking, you know, when we've talked about this diversity of students and, um, and how we, make sure that we're we're speaking to everybody and we're, we're including everybody but particularly how we include apprenticeship uh, blah, mm, apprentices that's the word in our comms um and make sure that we are signposting services that are available to them uh, because often a lot of them might not be uh, so i just wanted to to flag that before i i promise i would then move us on to our 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll look at what our action points to take away from today could be Yep, so speaking from an apprentice perspective, um, I am part of an FE institution and a HE institution at the same time doing courses in both. And uh, recently it's come to my attention that I've only been receiving comms from one side. So HE have been sending me the same stuff they've been sending out their full-time students. And the FE college hasn't sent me anything, not included me any of, in any of the kind of schemes or ideas that they've been having. And, you know, that's really worrying. Um, I'm sure there are many apprentices out there who are just not being reached out to. So I think the best way forward would be to make sure they're included in every comms and make sure that the services available to them are signposted. So not everything will be available because an apprentice wouldn't be on site full time. But making sure that if we do have a counsellor available that is online or in the office, that they can actually come in during their working hours and speak to them rather than that being available when they're on contracts doing full-time work for an employer. Um, and I also think it's really important that we signpost the services that are apprentice specific as well, because there are a lot of student specific um, services that are not available to apprentices and vice versa. So for example, recently Reemploy, have in, Reemploy uh, which you can Google, have introduced a scheme for um, nine months of emotional support for apprentices who are struggling. So that's a really good example of one. And there's also um, pilot groups being run on construction 
apprentice forest um, and they've been very successful for the Scottish government. So we think that um, areas for areas such as these, for example, construction, hair and beauty, um, health and social care and early years would really benefit from those because a lot of the people on these courses are on lower pay, which also links to um, poorer mental health, which we found in one of our studies. And, you know, these things all would come together quite well, especially at this time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm aware everyone wants a tea break. But I hope, you know, if you're interested in talking more about Apprentice Voice and how to reach out to them, then do reach out to the NSO NSOA. We've got some very, very talented people on board. Thank you. That's smashing. Thanks, Susanna. Um, and thanks everybody for, for adding to our board. Uh, I, I am now going to give us a 10 minute break as promised. Um, I'm going to, we're going to leave the, the recording running because we've decided that that would be an easy way to do it. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to stop step, stop sharing my screen, too many S's in that. Uh, and then I'm going to put up a break sign. Uh, so if we take a break now at 15.35 and we ask everyone to turn their videos and microphones off, and we come back at 15.45, uh, where we'll be discussing what our next steps could be. Thanks ever so much.
Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm just trying to fit it, sort my video out. I'll let everybody get settled and then I will start resharing the boards again. Just give Annette and Susanna a few minutes. Are we able to get a copy of the chat that's um, been going on? I think it's quite useful. Some people have made some good points. There's yeah, been some good absolutely. Points. Sorry. Sorry, Jess. <laughs> you go. Um, no, there's been some brilliant points. And Emma, I wondered, you've shared uh, some resources in it that I wondered if you actually wanted to share a bit more publicly for anybody that's watching um, around the, um, I think it was around like digital poverty and uh, buying laptops and things. Yeah, oh, it was funding, just, I think. yeah, someone had asked a question about um, how they could use their um, kind of um, hardship funds and things to, to purchase laptops for their students. Um, and it was just in response to that, that there's some general student support FAQs that SFC have put out. Um, so it was just, just for that, but they are publicly available um, just on the SFC website, if anybody wants to look at them. No, that's smashing, thank you. And I just it's not to... Sorry, it's not yeah. specifically about digital poverty, it's just, it does cover kind of what funds can be used for kind of buying laptops and things like that. Got you, no, thanks Emma. Um, and I've just also appreciated uh, in the chat, Claire, the last thing that you said about uh, the challenges supporting students and health being around counselling and therapy regulation. I just wonder if you want to just flag that before we go into the, the things, because that, that also feels something that we should share more widely. Yeah, it was just while I was making my cup of coffee, I thought I hadn't put it on a post it. Um, and there's been quite a lot of discussion in the kind of um, heads of service mail base around support for students, for instance, who have returned to their home countries. So um, counselling is something that's regulated. Um, so in America, you might need a licence for different states. And um, we're kind of finding that we might have students that returned home that might want to continue to use the service that we're offering it by telephone or online. So there's no kind of digital barrier, but that it's something that we're having to be really mindful of. Um, so I think a lot of services at the moment are kind of offering chop, like check-in to um, students. So a kind of welfare check-in, maybe trying to signpost them to local services. Um, but it's something that we're aware of as a sector going forward, particularly if we go into the new term with a lot of students um, in different countries, it's something we'll need to be mindful of. Yeah, I know that's something that um, the my student services staff have been speaking to me a lot about, and I think the way that they're they're approaching it is much like what you were saying. They're um, they're trying to help students identify local services um, and doing some research around that with them to try and and like encouraging them and to reach out for students who you know may feel uncomfortable on the phone and things like that. But I think they're also trying to keep a record of um, of those things so that if like we were to find out that a student was in crisis. Again, I'm, I might be wrong because this is every conversation that I, this wouldn't have been me. This is uh, my student services staff. But I think this is something like they would, um, they could then reach out to those services for the student if the student was in crisis and needed it in their local area as well. Um, but yeah, sense. I think that's how we've been addressing it. But it's an issue that St Andrew's having a lot of as well because we have so many overseas students, especially in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks ever so much uh, for adding those in. I'm just going to share my screen now. So we should all be looking at uh, our final board of the day, uh, which is hoping to kind of collate a little bit about the conversations that we've been having this afternoon. But also, you know, if anybody's seen any of the videos this morning, they want to throw in things from there um, or anything that they, they haven't added. I suppose, what do we think our next steps as a sector should be at the moment? 
Or if that's a bit too big of a question, because I appreciate I was quite ambitious when coming up with these. Um, how about what could our takeaways from today's discussions be based upon our own roles um, and what we might like to do next? So it looks again as though we've got a cracking amount of post-its on our boards um, and I'm seeing lots of themes around sharing good practice, uh, keep asking stakeholders what they need, um, so also thinking about things that would be student-led I suppose as well, oh yeah student-led, student-centred, peer-to-peer support um, and kind of re reviewing what we're doing as we go along but also making sure that we're not reinventing the wheel um, and that we're, we're learning from each other. Wouldn't does anybody have anything um, that they'd like to add? I, I also just really want to flag because I'm quite excited as I'm seeing this coming up, um, that things like the zines video and stuff that we shared this morning seems to have gone down really well. And um, that's also something to think about in terms of looking for upskilling, but also the different ways that we share our learning. Does that make sense? Is that, yeah. Um, I think that's really important, Jessica, your event today. And also, I think what we're trying to do at College Development Network every fortnight, we're meeting 
as long as the sector wants us to, we're meeting together and sharing practice as we move forward. And um, at the moment, we've been in this kind of crisis and reactive stage, as um, Al talked about. But I think moving forward, we could continue to use the space for some more creative solutions um, that will arise as we move into our sort of new norm. Yeah, the, the zines video earlier on today was so interesting. I, I'd never heard of a zine before, but I love these ideas of ways that students can find each other and do creative things while like contributing to like a, a bigger purpose. So you can use like a zine society or something else like that to promote a mental health event or even not even mental health focus, something completely different, but you can use these as ways to start forming community and giving people that student lifestyle that might be missing next year. I think it'd be beneficial to encourage and promote this. Very much so. And I suppose I've, I've also just read the, the bit that I, I'm presuming Susanna might have said about being apprentice as something practical to do. Um, and I wondered, Alice, that also goes back to your earlier point about being very thinking very hard and being quite dependent on the sort of different courses that students have chosen and how they've chosen to learn and how we reflect on that and offer support that either mirrors or matches those different approaches be it you know zines being an example of a different way that students could get together and offer those shared spaces but also making sure that the support that we're offering in other ways um, and the engagement that we're, we're seeking matches those courses or styles of, of learning. Yeah, I think probably, again, that's one of the, the kind of maybe the positives that have come out of this kind of crisis period and the reaction of, of staff and students is that they've come up with really innovative ways of delivering something in a completely different format. And, um, you know, ordinarily you would say, you know, delivering a practical subject online is totally not, it's not going to work. But the reality is when you have to make it work, you come up with ways of doing it. Um, so, yeah, I think that that kind of collaborative approach between students, uh, teaching staff, um, but also um, other agencies and, and there are, um, you know, uh, professional bodies involved in that as well. I'd say that the, um, I think the CITB um, building and construction have been really proactive in that sense in terms of coming up with uh, solutions to those things. So it's that kind of collaboration um, and uh, keeping that momentum going for all these people working together to come up with solutions rather than in isolation um, in, a, in, a, in a subject or even just in an institution itself. And I know as well, um, you know, in, in the chat with us, uh, both Christine and Kat talking about from a, an external organisation perspective, creating partnerships across the sector and making sure that, you know, people with lived experience are, are placed at the heart of that, but also we're, we're including this wider um, and looking at different ways that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of kind of the resources that Christine's been sharing and thinking about working when we're working together to be really creative, are there also other parts of the sector that might have done some of that for us and, and help us out with that um, as, as we try all of these things? I just had a question. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about any of the research that's been done kind of around the student voice on this or um, kind of student opinions. Um, I know Student Minds, I think, did a bit of work. Um, but I, I suppose I was thinking, particularly with new students, like um, we don't currently have any way that they're represented. And I was just wondering, um, 
if anyone knew of any research about kind of what their attitudes are to returning or starting university in September. Because um, I, I just think, you know, to have a good evidence base is so important for to, to build on. I don't know if anyone knows of anything. I was just going to say that um, I don't know of any um, actual research from an academic research point of view, but what we've found a lot through our Make Recovery Real project, which wasn't focused on students, but was just focused on people in uh, communities, was that um, bringing people together with a kind of sense of designed informality. So it wasn't a consultation process. It wasn't filling in a survey. It was running like conversation cafes. And um, before the pandemic, we did this on the ground with people and we got a whole load of evidence about um, what keeps people well and what support they need and what they really want in their community. And it kind of strikes me that that model of work could be adapted, um, it's quite flexible, um, to uh, the student body. Um, we're currently running a, a series of conversation cafes online, so we've adapted it from on the ground to online. So it's still we're still kind of piloting that, but um, I suppose the idea is that we're not setting we're not setting questions because there's answers we want to hear. We're kind of making it quite open and more of a conversation, so that that's where you get the kind of gold dust and uh, the things that people really, people will have to experience and students um, being part of that feedback and the type of support they want. And actually what we found from the on the ground work is there are a lot of common themes um, across it. Of course, everyone's, we recognize everyone's individual journey um, is different for them, but there are many, many common themes. So although I can't think of academic evidence, lived experience evidence and stories, of recovery can kind of inform quite a lot of our work. Thank you. Hi, I've just um, just posted a link in the chat that um, Youth Link and um, mm. the Youth Parliament have done a survey of young people on their kind of views and opinions on the lockdown. Um, I don't think the results have actually been published yet, um, but there might be some useful information that comes comes out of that. Um, when they are. So that's just in the chat there, but I'll pop a, pop a post it with a link on it as well. That's great, thank you. Just really conscious for a lot of those students that have had quite a, a difficult ending if they're coming from school, um, you know, and then to think about yeah, freshers week or, or getting a student flat and things like that um, in this new situation, but that, that's really good. Thank you for that. Check it out. Yeah, transition's tricky at the best of times, isn't it? Thanks, everyone. Does does anybody else have any um, sort of key takeaways that they'd like to flag uh, before we start to wrap up, really? Um, just a really small one, but honestly, just more conversations like this. I think this has been so helpful, like getting ideas across and being able to to help each other and get get feel like we're going somewhere with it. Like I don't know across the room, but I've definitely found this really helpful. So even if we just have more conversations, I think along the same lines, there's been a good amount of people saying things like managing student expectations and being open and transparent. And I think that um, something that we found really helpful is being as being as open and honest with students as we can at this point, especially about things that we don't know. Um, you know, we we do get a lot. Being a student association, we're getting a lot of questions like, "What's going to happen with Freshers Week?" Um, you know, we we have a lot of student traditions that take place in the first semester, and a lot of students asking about those as well. Um, and I think that it's really important for us actually just to say say that we don't know. 
um, and to be quite frank about that um, and manage student expectations in the in the in the sense that you know whilst we're in the situation actually you know there's not much we can do but we'll do everything we can to ensure they have the best experience possible absolutely flora i then wanted to ask you about the club penguin and when oh, you wanted to share that so yes um example of activity <laughs> this is fantastic um, I have to say I had nothing to do with this. This was entirely done by um, St Andrew's Nightline, um, who are wonderful, wonderful people. Their publicity officers. So, um, context as part of one of our classic student traditions in St Andrew's is that we have made it. We're on the first of May um, at sunrise. We all go. Well, we all. Some of us like. Some of us are like. I'm going to do the safety thing so that I don't have to get cold. Um, run into. We all run into the sea um, at sunrise. Um, and cleanse ourselves of our academic sins. So um, some of our Nightline representatives created, um, essentially made dip, but on Club Penguin. Um, so all this, these students came together through something which uh, is quite evocative. I think Club Penguin for someone who is in their early 20s is quite evocative of like your childhood. It's a very happy thing. It was all very sweet um, and it really created like a nice sense of student community. Um, we've also been doing some other things around that as well, actually, um, like we've had virtual soakings where students have um, participated sort of within their clubs, like tip, tipping, buckets of water, tip, uh, tipping buckets of water over their head. And then we're using that as like a fundraiser for the university's COVID fund, which is us being used to support students um, and people in the local community. Um, and I think that things like that as well, like taking student traditions that can't take place reworking them into something that then one like it gives you that shared sense of community but also gives students that feeling they're helping each other um you know my my mum got to chuck a bucket of ice cold water over my head over the weekend and she had a great time so i think um things like that have also been really positive that have come out of this um seeing how creative students can be i think that definitely comes out of um may dip on club penguin <laughs> <laughs> Fun is definitely important as, as someone who's only been out twice in the last two months, TikTok dance challenges are the way forward. <laughs> Can I um, say that I'd welcome another session like this, especially as we move in towards um, our induction and freshers and things, because we are really struggling at the moment to see how to work this. And we don't know how much social distancing will be part of that whether we should bring in small groups or what, but it could be a very different experience, uh, obviously. So um, any ideas and another, perhaps another chat later on this year before induction starts up would be really helpful for us. I think another, another thing that would be good about running another one um, would be that, um, so I don't, I don't know what the timelines are for other student associations, but I know for mine, I, I finished my role at the end of, um, the end of June. And I think it's going to be quite a um, quite a learning curve for my for our poor successors having to come in at this incredibly strange time, um, and also working remotely and trying to pick it all up as they as they go along. So I think that the student associations who are changing specific offices will be really useful. Mashing. Sorry, I appreciate. I shared my screen then, um, <laughs> and and showed you. All, all of my thoughts that I was just about to share with you. <laughs> too so, quick, Jessica, we didn't see them. I do apologise. It's all right, Molly did and flagged it to me. Thank you. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I was going to um, going to share was uh, sort of flag, you know, the um, fan fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Morag and, and everybody for saying that uh, you'd really appreciate another session like this. Um, and to sort of, I suppose, just flag in case anybody isn't aware that um, Think Positive have revised our aims and objectives during uh, the COVID circumstances. Uh, and one of the revised aims is to aid student associations and institution based responses to student mental health during COVID-19, uh, which is where this event today has come from. So I appreciate we were already supposed to be uh, doing something for you, but um, this this event has come from that but we also have our weekly forum meetings that are for primarily at the moment they've, they've started we're trying to build them from the participants of the student mental health agreements 
but they're equally as well, you know, we're, we have a Slack channel where we're trying to gather these questions and challenges every week to see, you know, as it's, as it's progressing and as, as we're moving forward, um, what are the current challenges? What, what do people want to share? What are people working on? What resources have they found that are fantastic? Um, and again, so, it, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel each time. Um, and so there's, I suppose I wanted to flag those as places where we can continue these conversations, but also really appreciate the fact that you'd like more things like this. Um, and I'm sure we'd be really interested in um, supporting you with that. Um, that that would be fab. Um, I appreciate I'm now starting to move into my wrap up. Uh, so I just want to check that I'm not going to talk over anybody if I do. No, fab. Um, I mean, really, we just want to say a huge thank you uh, to everyone who has joined us today and participated in all of our discussions. So not just this, but but Twitter as well. Um, I mean, I'm totally biased, but I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, on a personal note, I have totally appreciated everybody um, sharing all their, their thoughts. Firstly, really, we want to thank the 15 people who've given their time up this afternoon to join us on our Miro boards and to have uh, patiently practiced with us and our use of technology over the, the past couple of weeks in preparation for today. Uh, we really do value the time that you've offered us and we are so appreciative of the ideas and the experiences that you have shared. Secondly, uh, we want to thank those who pre-recorded the videos for us this morning. So I know we've made some reference to them. If you haven't seen them already, they're on this YouTube channel. Um, they're pretty cool. Uh, what we did was we worked with uh, some of our student mental health agreement participants and some of our external network uh, connections. And just very similar to, to this, had a chat about how their work had changed, what was going well, what were their solutions, um, to do a little bit more again of that that sort of idea and best practice sharing. Um, and then lastly, we also wanted to offer a huge thank you to everyone who's remained engaged at home. Um, it was really disappointing to have to cancel our in-person, well, postpone, we haven't canceled it. Um, and it was incredibly cheering to be met with so much enthusiasm when we were, you know, just announcing or trialing the ideas that we had for, for alternatives for today. So, I mean, that that's fantastic. Thank you so much for um, continuing to support us to continue this work uh, so that we can keep on showcasing the ingenuity and resilience of all of you guys, really, uh, and, and Scotland's student mental health support. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it is cheesy, but I'm going to say this again. We are all incredibly valuable cogs in the wheel of Scotland's student mental health support, uh, and we are incredibly thankful for everyone for showing up today and every day. And we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Very much. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.